Alrighty. Thank you all so much for coming. And thank you for, for those of you that traveled. Thanks for coming here. Um, we're going to talk about a hypervisor for Airflow, you know, a new component of our platform that we're really excited about. Uh, this talk is going to be about kind of some of the learnings that went into uh, how we got to today and then kind of what we're building it and what it's going to let you do, what we're building and what it's going to let you do. <laughs> um, so to start off as intros, um, I'm Viraj, one of the co-founders at Astronomer and I'm field CTO. And I'm Vikram Koka. I end up engineering at Astronomer. All righty. So our goal at Astronomer, you know, is to build the best airflow service for everyone. That doesn't, that means no matter where you are on the adoption curve, whether you're, the, you're a first time bag rider or you're very, um, you're very mature in your airflow usage, whether you're running one environment or a thousand environments, whether you're running on GCP or AWS, we want to build an airflow service that is the best for you. Um, and we've been at this for a little bit. So we've learned a lot around what makes an actually good airflow service. Um, so I just want to give you a kind of brief history because that's going to lead into kind of how our architecture has evolved over time and why we're so excited about our hypervisor. Um, so if you turn back the clock about half a decade uh, is when we decided to go all in on Apache Airflow as our company. Um, we were around a little bit before 2018. We weren't really doing Airflow as a product, but we were using it as community members. Um, and in May 2018, we decided to pivot our whole company and only focus on that. Um, you know, fast forward about what, like 18 months from May of 2018, and uh, Vikram, with help from the community, uh, helped push out Airflow 2. And that was really monumental because Airflow 2 really set the foundation for a lot of the things that we wanted to build both inside of Airflow and inside of our commercial product. Um, for those of you that came to Data Council last year, you saw firsthand that we announced that we uh, acquired Datakin, the creators of Open Lineage, in March of 2022. Um, you know, there's so many times where I've talked to customers who have said, hey, yeah, we really need help with orchestration, but now with all of our data moving around, we need lineage. Uh, so we think that what we're building together with the folks at Datakin is going to go a long way towards solving our customers' problems. Um, and then really only about a year ago where we actually available on all three major clouds. Uh, so now you can run Astra on AWS, GCP, and Azure. Um, so, you know, that was a very, very brief condensed history. Um, and it was honestly, that makes it look like we're a lot smarter than we were, right? We made a lot of mistakes along those ways. Um, so when you look at that, you ask, and I ask myself like, hey, what did we learn along the way? And more importantly, how are we actually taking an action with that in order to make our lives better and more importantly, our customer lives better? So I want to give you a brief history lesson on our platform. And then Vikram's going to talk about how it's going to be changing going forward architecturally. Um, so who here has tried running this command, helm install Apache slash Airflow? Show of hands. I know Jed's tried it a few times, but um, in the early days, our, the first thing we had to do was figure out how to run Airflow on Kubernetes effectively. Um, and Helm was a great, chart for, uh, was a great start for that. Um, it made it so that we could say, go to our customer and say, hey, here's Airflow running with all of Airflow's features. Um, it made it so that customers could say, I'm going to deploy an image to my Airflow environment and change things like Python requirements, uh, OS level packages, and other deeper things that they need control over. Um, and let us do dynamic provisioning. So we built a little API that wrapped Helm that made us able to CRUD Airflow environments. So I could say, hey, go spin up an Airflow environment over here. Let me run some stuff on it and spin it down afterwards. Um, and this took us a really long way because a lot of customers just want stable Airflow or they want several stable, stable Airflows and they want to be able to deploy their code to it and watch it just run in a way that mirrors how it ran on their laptops. So then, you know, we started going a little deeper and one thing we saw was that we had demand for Airflow on all three major clouds. Um, this kind of makes sense because there's an Airflow service that the clouds provide in all three major clouds. So it would make sense that uh, our customers want to run Airflow on all the clouds. Um, and Helm was really a great start, but as we kind of got deeper into what our customers wanted, we found ourselves pretty limited by what Helm could give us, especially when we thought about multi going across multiple clouds. You know, the Kubernetes services and all the clouds are a little different, and Helm just turned into something that limited us more than expanded us. Um, the other thing we found is that Airflow has a lot of components, and we wanted to add more components. So there's already the scheduler, which you can run one or many. Um, there's a web server, there's uh, workers, there's a database, um, there's the trigger. Um, and in order to provide a really, really reliable service, you'll oftentimes need really fine-grained fine control of all these different things. 
You know, what if your triggers want to auto scale? What if you want to scale up and down the number of schedulers? You really need fine grained control over these things, especially as you think about edge cases around doing airflow upgrades or migrations or anything else of the sort. Um, and finally, you know, a big thing we found was auto scaling wasn't something that was optional. People wanted to auto scale up based on load. You know, a lot of their DAGs kicked off at UTC midnight and then not pay for idling in infrastructure after. So we built a KATS operator. Uh, that's actually the core of our platform right now that extends the Kubernetes API to give us more fine gain control of core airflow components, uh, which lets us provide a really reliable and scalable service for our customers. And we're really proud of what we built. You know, as of today, we have some customers that run one airflow environment and others that run over a thousand. Uh, we are available in one region, one cloud, and then all the regions and all the clouds. Um, and one of my favorite things to do is if I look at like the event data coming in from our UI, sometimes there's a handful of users on it and sometimes there's a lot more users on it. And these users are all around the world. Um, so I can confidently say today that we have built an Airflow service for everyone that uh, you know, I think really adds value to what people are trying to do. Um, but you know, I'm, what really gets me excited is where we're kind of taking things and what we've learned along the way after building this so far. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to Vikram to talk a little bit about what we've learned along the way here. From our users. So one of the key things we learned as part of uh, deploying the Airflow service is that the vast majority of people honestly just want to write DAGs, they want to update DAGs, and then they actually just want to want to make sure that it runs, right? There's a core element of like, you know, the core thing which they want is data to show up on time. And uh, they really don't want to worry about what the underlying system configurations are and what the system configurations are needed, you know, what is uh, the right capacity to configure, what is the right auto scaling to set up, and so on and so forth. The key thing for any customer really is like, you know, SLA failures or like, you know, something like, hey, the data didn't show up at time, we couldn't actually meet our customer SLAs. And that's actually the key problem. And uh, a lot of times that actually happens just because of not the right, the right level of scaling and there's a bottleneck in the system and things fail. And that's really a pain for most people to kind of work through. One of the key challenges, I think, which is both which has really helped Airflow, but also has been a challenge is we've got a leaky abstraction with Airflow, right? I mean, there's like, you know, what the resource configurations or what the resource levels needs are like, you know, a core element of what's actually needed with Airflow. And that, but that actually becomes a, which really helps from like the breadth of adoption and being able to deal with a variety of different system and inf infrastructure level configurations. But when it comes to managing it, it definitely makes it quite a bit more of a challenge and people really, really don't want to deal with it. So what we ended up actually doing is realizing as part of this that people, yes, they are able to configure Airflow, but that doesn't actually mean that everybody knows what are all the different configurations in Airflow and how they actually interact. And there have been multiple times, even as part of new Airflow releases that we talk about, like, you know, how many configuration options are we up to now? And I was chatting with Jed a little bit ago saying, you know, last time we checked this about 135, they said, hey, I think it's now like a little bit over 140. And, but that's really hard for anybody to kind of understand all these different Airflow configurations, how they actually interact and what the right configuration is for their particular set of deployments, right? And so the key thing, which we actually talked to a lot of people is saying, hey, look, I just want to focus on my pipelines running. I just want my DAG to run. I want my data to, to actually show up. And, you know, when you tell me go configure this number of like, you know, options either for the DAG file processor or a number of scheduler and like, and all this stuff. I really, really don't want to know that and I don't want to deal with that. So we ended up building a solution for that, which is actually what we call the Astral Hypervisor. And this is a core part of our Astronomer platform, which we are actually rolling out now. And what the Astral Hypervisor really does is basically manage all the configurations on top of Airflow so that people don't actually have to learn about Airflow system configurations. This is really built on top of the Kubernetes operator, which Viraj just talked about. The Kubernetes operator actually does the configuration so that it actually deploys this, the right configuration to the right Airflow deployment so that it runs basically uh, without you having to kind of know about it. But ultimately, what is the right configuration to run? And that is actually determined by the Airflow hypervisor, uh, actually the Astro hypervisor which focuses on like saying, hey, this is the load, this is the number of bags, this is the number of tasks which are actually going to be run at this period of time, and this is really based on deep observability of the Airflow deployment itself, and that's actually what 
we are very happy to talk about today. Now, our key goal here is to auto scale everything. And for this slide, I'm going to turn this back to Virat. Bye. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was actually pretty, uh, I was just pretty impressed. Vikram's like, I know who Drake is, but uh, he's like, <laughs> other than that, you have to take this slide. Um, so given we are in Toronto, um, there's a lot of ways to auto scale airflow workers. You can use different executors. Uh, you can even just run fewer workers, Kubernetes pod operators. Um, but like I said before, there's peak load with more than just workers, schedulers, triggers, et cetera. So with the hypervisor, we can not just scale the workers, but also the number of schedulers and the number of triggers to make sure that your data arrives on time every time. Um, Vikram, you want to talk about the cultural significance of this meme here? I don't know. <laughs> so, auto scaling. One of the key things we really want to chat about with respect to auto scaling is really not warning anybody to kind of think about the airflow configuration file again with respect to system configurations and all the elements which actually go in. There's a lot of great components which we've rolled out which are independently conf configurable and controllable as part of uh, airflow. Since 2.2, I think we also have the trigger. I think they're separated out of the DAG file processor somewhere along the way after, and I've kind of lost track of which release that was actually in. But with all this configurations and all the separation, we have a lot of flexibility, but with that comes complexity. But the really good thing with Airflow is, and this is what we've invested a lot of time in, is we can understand because it is predictable. We can understand when new DAGs get scheduled, when new tasks basically get launched. And one of the things as part of learning about all this is we really have a high degree of confidence that we can actually proactively manage and scale up systems based on uh, and therefore be able to auto scale every single component as part of the Airflow deployment. Our key goal, honestly, is that people really focus on the DAGs. They never think about Airflow system configurations ever again. Part of this is like you know understanding visibility and what does this really mean? We really believe strongly that we need to actually be able to understand visibility across Airflow deployments. A lot of people have deployments not only in dev but in prod, but it's like multiple prod instances, typically bro bro broken up by across teams. They also have dev and stage and prod instances. And when things go well, there's dependencies across them. Everything works beautifully. You get an insight at the end of the day, and that actually works really well. However, if something breaks, especially early in a deployment, and that actually has ripple, typically actually has ripple effects. And uh, that can basically cause a bad insight, which basically becomes a problem. One key thing which we've actually done as part of the hypervisor is provide a set of capabilities for visibility across all Airflow deployments uh, within Astronomer. And this allows you to kind of look at not only the state of the, of the DAGs themselves, but it is the state of the metadata, be able to take be able to take action based on what you see from these particular deployments, which really for us provides the foundation for building up capabilities and visibility and like you know, actions across deployments, across your entire data ecosystem. But really it's such a foundation, right? One of the key things as a foundation for this is that we can actually use that visibility and observability ourselves towards, for the Astro hypervisor, towards saying, hey, is this deployment healthy? And ideally, is your entire data ecosystem healthy? Because as part of scaling, you might actually think there is something which is the right configuration early on, but configurations change. And that's the really the very, very common thing with a data ecosystem such as Airflow is people add DAGs, but even more commonly, they, they add tasks to existing DAGs, which can actually cause delay in existing data sets, which basically need to be published either internally as part of a, an application or externally for, for a different customer to actually consume that particular insight. And for that, we really needed to make sure we had that level of visibility across the board so that we can actually take actions in this particular manner. Once we actually started gathering these particular sets of data from every single Airflow deployment, and we actually gathered this as a time series metric into, uh, into, Airflow, into the Astro hypervisor, we could actually determine, is this deployment healthy? And one of the key things is that deployment healthy, basically meaning like, you know, are there unreasonable delays in scheduling? Are there, are the workers getting throttled? Therefore, new tasks are, not, are getting run versus not getting run and all the elements, rather than very simply looking at an infrastructure metric of is the scheduler up or down, is basically the workers up or down. And this really be able to kind of do deep observability on the airflow deployment with respect to how pipelines are actually running, how tasks are actually running, are there basically things getting stuck and be able to look at this. 
Now with this time series then, what we could actually then determine is automatically take action, right? Is based on the amount of load in the system, like, you know, hey, there is basically a lot of DAGs coming up. As Viraj said, a lot of DAGs tend to be skewed at on a daily basis or like an hourly basis. And at that time, there's basically peaks and valleys. And that's really common, which we've actually seen with every single Air Force deployment, is that there is peaks at times, typically based on like, you know, some kind of time interval. And we wanted to be able to kind of schedule stuff and increase the load for not only the workers, but basically every single airflow system component so that this actually happens automatically without somebody needing to kind of think about, hey, what is my peak load and therefore how do I scale this, but also do this dynamically. So a key thing element for us here is to be scale up when basically there is demand, when, when uh, pipelines are basically being run, but also scale down when when there is no need and therefore being able to save costs because ultimately the simplest solution is to scale everything up to max but that is prohibitively expensive and nobody really wants to do that because that has got such significant cost implications so part of our the key element here which we're actually rolling out is proactive action based on the deep observability so this is really what the three parts which you actually see the first step was to be able to roll out configurations through the communities operator and then be able to kind of say, hey, what do we need to configure based on the system load? The second step was really to kind of gain the gain a deep visibility into the state of the airflow deployment across a period of time so that then we can say, hey, what, what is actually going on? Determine a healthy versus an unhealthy system. And then the third step is to be able to roll out proactive action be based on like, you know, what the system configuration is and is going to be so that again, we can scale up all the airflow deployments and the airflow system as needed for effective throughput of like, you know, the, the pipelines to be run without anybody needing to take any individual action or think about the airflow system configuration at all. And with that, I'll hand that back to Raj. Awesome. So we have a trial flow now and we have a, a free trial that you can just go in and try out all the things we talked about um, that we'd love if you did. You know, we've worked very hard to build an airflow service for everyone and presenting at Airflow Summit is a huge milestone for us as a company. Uh, so if you get some extra time, try out our trial flow, give us some feedback, and we'd love to hear from you. Well, thank you for all the great work on the hypervisor. I have a quick question on how it scales. So you did mention about, um, you know, there is a proactive action that you take when you determine there is a number of DAGs are getting scheduled or tasks are getting scheduled. In my experience, I have seen when there are lots of DAGs or getting scheduled at the same time, it's not the workers that typically, you know, uh, fail, but it's a scheduler that fails. And in Airflow V2, you know, the way that I read in Airflow documentation, it's high available scheduler, and that's not a highly scalable scheduler. So how do you, you know, scale the scheduler to you know, get to what we need for the performance that we need to handle the number of DAGs or the tasks that need to be run, like say 10 minutes or an hour. So can I ask uh, which version of Airflow you're using right now? Um, I've used version 2.4, okay. even 2.5. Okay. So we actually do scale the scheduler and by scheduler here, I'm actually using the term loosely, frankly, right? It is because the scheduler here, when we use the term, we actually tend to use the DAG file processor, the scheduler, the trigger, and all those particular components. And uh, one of the key things we try to kind of look at is, uh, for example, if there's a if, it, if the scheduler is kind of going through the loop of processing a lot of like you know reading a lot of new DAG files. Right, so it depends on the deployment model. Hey, you're pushing a lot of new DAG files, and then uh, all of these files need to be read. Then, then it could well be that the DAG file processor is kind of running out of juice, and therefore we basically need additional elements on the additional DAG file processors. And like you know, there's a randomization of like you know the, the configuration, kind of going back to the airflow configuration again to be able to read these and stuff like that. There's a lot of cases though where you might say, hey, look, we haven't touched the DAGs and the DAGs are still there. It is purely based on tasks basically being run and there is a spike. And there's a couple of things there about scaling the, uh, just the sheer number of scheduler processes themselves towards being able to have more things. But it is 
they our intent, honestly, even with 2.0, was to be able to active, active, active. So we actually do have benchmarks where an additional number of schedulers do actually increase the overall tax throughput. And I'm happy to share the benchmarks on you know how well that actually works. There is a key element as well of of like also looking at scaling it vertically as well as horizontally. So part of our determination here is to say based on hey, is it the number of tasks which are actually scheduled at this time, which therefore need more throughput from the scheduler or additional element, or is it the DAG file processor? And how many of these like you know can we scale up the trigger? So it really depends on the kind of component and depends on what the need is for us to be able to scale from like you know one to n, and then also from one to zero or zero one. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Question: um, Is there any additional cost of usage for using the um, hypervisor? Does that matter? That's one and two is. How do you maintain the distributedness of hypervisor, meaning not ensure that it becomes a single point of failure? So let me answer the second question first. Uh, like anything which we've done with Airflow since 2.0, we've basically gone with the same model of like an you know, active, active, active. So that we actually don't have any single points of failure. I mean, if you've seen that pattern, we've actually done the same thing for the trigger. We've done the same thing for like, you know, every other component. And that's exactly the same thing which we're doing to the hypervisor as well. So that it actually, there would be multiple copies of this executing based on what the need is. We also have liveliness probes on it so that none of those things actually fail as well. So we are actually fairly confident on that particular model, which we've actually been using since 2.0 going forward on the active, active, active model. Uh, it doesn't keep any state. I mean, the state is basically stored on like, you know, what, what is actually be getting stored in the, in the Airflow Meta database. So again, the, you don't feel like there's a single point of failure in that, uh, from that particular perspective, uh, in the case might be. All right, thank you, everyone. Yeah, okay. Yeah.